Hi, my name is Nicholas Miser, and today for Human Stories Blog, I'd like to talk to you about reimagining the world through play. More specifically, I have two questions that I'd like to think about with you today. And that the first one is, how has play shaped the world up until now? Second, how can play help us change the world that we find ourselves in? And I'm going to make three main points as I work through the, that first question. And that is that play both predates and defines humanity. And second, play helps us imagine a different world, actually lots of different worlds. And third, when we imagine the world differently, that shapes our actions and our interactions with the world. And so doing, that shapes the world itself and changes the world in which we find ourselves. So when we look back on the ways that humans have adapted to and adapt, made adaptations to the world, we find that play runs through the heart of all of that. To the extent that Johann Huysinga, the play theorist, uh, wrote a book titled Homo Ludens because he believed that human humanity, the player, actually was a more accurate designator than hu Homo sapiens or humans, the thinker, that play was a characteristic that was uh, foundational uh, to all parts of culture not just the parts that we would consider uh, unserious, like games that we already know are play, but things that are very serious, like law, war, religion, government. He found a, the play spirit as running through all of that. One of the most important features that he saw in play was the creation of what he called the magic circle by way of analogy. And what he means is that every play, every, every set of games is bounded in both space and time. Things that happen inside those boundaries operate under different sets of rules than those that operate outside of it. So in this picture that you see here, we have trial by combat, which was, or trial by ordeal, which was a practice in medieval Europe. And in this, we see a legal dispute being settled by a structured duel between two people. Now, outside of the bounds of that square that you see, one person killing another uh, has no more significance than it might otherwise have. Uh, it's just an act of violence that could be attributed to any number of things. But inside the temporal and spatial bounds of this magic circle, uh, the people at this time were playfully, even though uh, dead, uh, lethally, reimagining what the actions inside that space meant. In this case, to kill another person was to demonstrate your innocence and your victory in the legal debate. In other words, the space inside that square is a different world than that is, that's outside of it. And as they imagined the world differently, then they, they acted differently and it shaped their behaviors. Now, there are lots of ways that we can define a game, but one thing that a game is, is this structured playful practice that humans use to generate and explore an alternate reality. And in a less serious example than what we just looked at, we could think about this in terms of a game like Tetris, the classic puzzle game. Tetris allows the player to ex uh, experience and explore an alternate world in which the, the boundaries of the world are the rectangles of their screen. And the only thing that exists are these brick walls and the geometric shapes that fall from the sky. This is a completely different experience of space, obviously, than we experience in our daily lives. And if you've ever talked to someone who's played Tetris for a long time, or if you've played it for a long time yourself, you know that after a while, the way that you perceive the shapes around you even starts to, to shift a little bit. But it doesn't just change our experience of time. This alternate world that, that Tetris generates structures our experience of time too. In Tetris, the blocks start out dropping fairly slowly and then they increase over time, creating a rising sense of anxiety as the player tries to manage and, and uh, make the blocks go away and maintain that pile, uh, keep that pile from getting too close to the top and giving them the game over. That's a different experience of time than we experience in, in much of our lives. Although game theorist Jane McGonigal pointed out that, wow, that, that experience of time and the anxiety of trying to make everything fit in, that's actually really similar to the ways that we experience time when we are overburdened by jobs and chores and, and all the kinds of stresses and strains of modern life. So this shows that not only do games allow us to uh, imagine the world differently, 
in, in, the, sen in the sense that we saw with uh, something like trial by combat and, and shape the world even in serious spheres. In spheres like uh, in recreational games like Tetris, we can think of them as a lens that lets us reflect on other experiences that we have outside of the magic circle. And that magic circle is very porous and permeable. Things, ideas and understandings and practices are always passing back and forth between it. So having framed games in this way as a way for experiencing and exploring alternate realities or other worlds, what can that tell us about people today? Well, I wanna kind of rewind the clock a little bit and look at uh, the way that 16th century Europeans began to imagine the world in new ways. They started to play new games with reality. And uh, based on that, I wanna say that we live in a world that has been shaped by those imaginations. We call that world modernity. And third, if we want to get to better world states, if we want to change the world in which we find ourselves, the first step, just like it has been throughout all of human history, is to imagine them and then to realize them. And lastly, to drive that point home, say that games are a powerful tool for helping us imagine those better worlds we might want to create. So when I say that modernity is a game, what I mean is that starting around the 16th century in Europe, there, are a, there was a change in the ways that humans imagined the world. And based on the definition of, of games that I just gave you, we can call that a game. It's a structured set of rules that generate a different state of affairs inside than outside. So uh, modernity is uh, characterized by uh, four features that I'll, I'll pull out here. There's more than them, of course, but we've got capitalism, industrialism, colonialism, and individualism. Now, capitalism, what we mean by that in, in one sense is that we imagine the world as if everything in it can be commodified. This is not how the world had been conceived of before that, that every single thing could be turned into a tool of profit. Second, industrialism, it's kind of related, but specifically, I want you to think of like a factory uh, with, a, uh, with an assembly line and the way that industrialism envisions that not only can everything be commodified, everything can be measured for maximum efficiency and maximum profit. And that began to spread to more and more things to the point where uh, now, if you are an, a worker in an Amazon fulfillment uh, facility, your very movement throughout that facility is measured down to the second in times rationally uh, measuring every aspect of, of existence, every aspect of the world. But in colonialism, what we see is that we're imagining that uh, everything that is outside of that magic circle of capitalism and industrialism is free game to be brought into the circle, whether or not anyone else wants to be playing this game or not. And then lastly, and this is the one I'll focus on the most, is individualism. Meaning that uh, Europeans in the 16th century increasingly began to think of themselves not as uh, members of an interconnected set of relationships, uh, but as uh, isolated and atomized individuals separated from those relationships. And that became a very important way for integrating those uh, humans into the industrial and capitalist system as workers separated from the, uh, the more embedded labor that they had been doing before that. Now, focusing in on individualism, there's one particular effect that I want to highlight. And that's something that Max Weber, who's a sociologist writing in the early 20th century, described as disenchantment. So Weber said that things like rationalism, bureaucratization, profit maximization, those games that we just talked about of new ways of viewing the world uh, made humans essentially like cogs in the machine. They reduce them to lines on a balance sheet. And this troubled Weber because he found that it stripped the human experience of connectedness and wonder from the world, whether that's connectedness with the, the environment or with other people, that individualism, that isolated sense that gr has grown and grown over the course of the games of modernity. And we've seen that in particularly potent ways, of course, in the past year, where we uh, often have been literally physically isolated from each other. So I had Weber's ideas of disenchantment and isolation in the front of my head last year in 2020 when I was teaching a class on the history and culture of games and suddenly found that the students I had been interacting with and the learning community we had built together was now not able to physically meet. And of course, we all went through something like this. And what we did the first session that we had virtually was to play this game developed by Albert Kong called the Weeness. 
And this is a, kind of like a role-playing game, but it's different from something like Dungeons and Dragons or the role-playing games that you might be familiar with. It's based on just a very small set of language rules that you um, play through together as a small group of people that change the way that you think about yourself and your relationship with other people. And I think this is a great example of the ways that we can use games to create a different world inside of the bounds of the game that help us to see things differently. Now we had all been very isolated and we were all going through a variety of different strains and struggles just like people are continuing to do now uh, even as the pandemic con continues. Well, uh, in the Weenus, the, the rules that you go through eventually start restricting your use of first person singular language. So you start out not just be, not being able to say the word I, and then you start out, and then uh, many times people will start saying things like, oh, well, this guy is from Michigan. Uh, and then eventually the game says, well, in round two, you can't say this guy anymore. And eventually over a series of rounds, most people that play it find themselves in their group, in their weeness. Um, referring to themselves always in the first person plural. So they might say, we are from Michigan. And if we were playing that game together right now and you thought, wait a second, I'm not from Michigan, then you would just understand that I was talking about this segment of the collective identity that we have built. And when I played this with students, they, they commented a lot on how uh, they found that, that langu those language rules, very simple as they were, it's a very simple game, were hitting up against sort of hardwired walls in their head. And that talking in that way helped, helped us to reframe the, the challenging and the challenges and the suffering that we were going through, but also that we were seeing in the media that uh, everyone was suffering. So it was no longer that people out there were uh, dying and suffering from COVID-19, but we were suffering from COVID-19 and we had to take care of each other and those that were around us. So this small little set of games, this structured, playful way of imagining the world and building a temporary uh, collective identity shaped the way that we thought about very real problems that we found ourselves in the midst of. And this is exactly what uh, science fiction author Ursula K. Le Guin had in mind when she, uh, when receiving the National Book Award in 2014, said that she thought that hard times were coming and that we would need to have people who could see alternatives to how we live now, see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being. And she ended that speech by saying that we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. And I take a lot of inspiration from that as I look at the, the ways that play even more than powerful stories like Ursula K. Le Guin's, even more than powerful media of, of a variety of different kinds uh, can uh, shape our understanding of reality. When we play, we actually take a part in that imagined world. We interact with it and the flexibility of the worlds that we can imagine becomes very, very powerful because we participate in it and it changes us. And then as we leave the magic circle, we can change the way that we interact with the world. The way that different ways of imagining the world go in different directions. Sometimes that's, that's positive uh, and sometimes that's negative. As we saw modernity imagined the world in ways that in many, in many, many cases were harmful to human thriving. Uh, and it's now often said that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. And that's a statement not just about the power of the systems in which we find ourselves that strip out meaning from our existence and strip out our sense of connectedness, but the smallness of our imagination and our need to develop that imagination through play to imagine better worlds and then to act so that we can achieve those worlds. Thank you so much for watching. Peace and light to you and yours. So I, I, you know, I sometimes do this. And